Hebrews chapter 12. Before we read, let's ask the Lord for help. Father, we come to you once again. We know that this is your word. We know in this very book, we, we have been told that it's living. Something that is living, it has life, it has movement. There's energy there, there's power there, life. Oh, we long for life and the Word is life and these words are life and this, this Bible is a living Word and we know that it's sharp and it's like a sword and it cuts and it separates and, and that's what we want. Cut and separate and breathe life into us through it. May it not be stagnant, may it not be idle. Lord, we, we pray that this hour before us would truly be profitable. Just speak, Lord. Speak, O oh Lord. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Hebrews chapter 12. And I know it's been a while that, since we've been here. Um, I can kind of interrupt the flow. Let's, let's read a rather lengthy portion of Scripture here. Hebrews chapter 12, you remember that prior to this we came out of the faith chapter. 12.1, therefore since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, those witnesses from Hebrews 11. Let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run That's the idea here. Let us run. Run with endurance the race that is set before us. Run. Don't coast. Don't meander. Don't drift. Run. Don't walk. Don't sleep. Looking to Jesus. Your eyes need to be somewhere. Remember that last chapter was on faith. Faith is what looks to Christ. It connects us to Christ. We're trusting Him. We're trusting in what He's done. We're trusting in who He is. We're trusting in that work. His perfect life, life unblemished. The cross. The founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him, endured the cross. As He was motivated, so we should be. There's joy before us. A few more rolling suns at most. I mean, think about it. The, the day is coming when we are going to start dropping off. One by one. Entering glory. You think about this, this bridegroom who jumps over hills and mountains. I think about there in, in that prayer of His as He's leaving this world, my desire is that they may be with me where I am. He desires that. I mean, can you imagine it? He busts through those crowds. He's leaping over mountains because you're there. And His heart has been set on you. And that's going to happen to us one by one. I mean, the day is going to come. We're going to start falling off. We're going to start going home. The joy that's set before us. He had a joy set before Him. He endured the cross. He endured suffering because of that joy. Despising the shame, He's seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider Him who endured from sinners such hostility against Himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Why? Because they were enduring the same thing. Hostile sinners doing things to them. And your struggle against sin... You've not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And it seems like what he's saying is their struggle against sin is to not sin as hostile sinners are coming against them. Don't respond in sinful ways. You haven't resisted yet to the point where they've actually put you to death. There's more resisting. There's more suffering ahead. You guys are only part way through the race. That's us. You haven't got to the end yet. 
And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? And that's the, that's the issue. I mean, that's why people want to fall out. That's why people get discouraged, because they forget something. Our minds need to be active. That's how we keep going well in the race. Have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by Him. For the Lord disciplines the one He loves and chastises every son whom He receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom His Father does not discipline? If you're left without discipline in which all have participated, then you're illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we've had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they are earthly fathers. They disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. But God disciplines us for our good. That doesn't mean that our earthly fathers don't, but not all do, and not all do all the time. But our heavenly Father does all the time for our good, that we may share His holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. We're in training We don't just get saved and then just kind of coast to the end. You get saved and now it's training time. That's what this life is all about. Therefore, lift up your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees. By the way, the title of this sermon is The Drooping Christian. And it comes from verse 12. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint but rather be healed. Strive for peace with everyone and for holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. That no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. That no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears." Okay, jump back to verse 12. There's there's my title text. The drooping Christian. Now, the ESV says drooping. If we were to literally look at this in the Greek, there's, there's only one verb and it's at the end. This literally reads, the weak hanging hands and weak paralyzed knees set straight. Get them right. I don't think it's very difficult for us to see our author's painting a picture for us. That when we apply it to spiritual things and to the Christian life, you know what this is? Go from drooping. If you're not drooping, I mean, you know what it looks like. Somebody's drooping, somebody's discouraged, somebody's hanging down. Over against what? When somebody... Their face is all lit up and they seem energetic. It's, the whole idea here is he's saying, get encouraged again. That's the idea. This is a charge. That, by the way, this is an imperative. This is a commandment. He is saying to Christians, you have, now think about this, you have a responsibility to run this race encouraged. And, and you know, you might think, well, if I'm discouraged, how do you just tell somebody to be encouraged? Somebody comes in here and they're all, it doesn't work just to walk up to somebody and if they're cast down, just say, don't be cast down. No, that's not the way Scripture operates. Don't you remember what he said? Have you forgotten? You see, something needs to be going on in the mind that we have a responsibility to be thinking about in order to not be discouraged. 
We'll look at that more in a, in a little bit. But this, all through this book, is this not a book that's all about not being discouraged, not being down, not being cast down, not giving up in this race? You don't need to look at these, but I just shot through very quickly this morning. Listen to this. We're his house if indeed we hold fast our confidence. A confident people. How about, that was out of 3, 618. Listen to this. We who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. This idea of confidence, this idea of encouragement, sticking with this thing, keep going. 1019 and 10, this comes up repeatedly, this idea. Therefore, brother, since we have confidence... This is, this, that's, what, that's what he means when he's saying this. Be confident. Be people of courage as you run this race. 10.25, you know we're, we're not to ne- neglect meeting together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. Encouraged. That's why we come together. We need to encourage one another. We need to get people to where they're running this race with vigor. They're running it with courage. They're running it with confidence. 10.35 Therefore, do not throw away your confidence. That's what, that's, that's what this letter is about. This is a letter to keep people running in confidence. You know why? Because when you lose your confidence, when you lose your courage, you're in grave danger. And we don't always feel just the degree to which there is a danger. You know what this is saying? Verse 12. Raise the shoulders. Get those hands up. Swing those arms. Flex those knees. Be revived and run. Notice verse 13. Look at it. And make straight paths for your feet. Now remember, back up in verse 1, we read it. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Here in verse 13, we have, again, it's a commandment. It is a charge from God. It is an imperative. Get those feet straight. Why? Because when the feet aren't straight, what happens? You go off the path. That's, what, that's what's going on here. You, you go off the path. You remember how this book started? We have to pay closer attention to these things lest what happens? You drift. What happens when you drift? The feet aren't straight. That's how you drift. You don't drift off the path when your feet are headed straight down the path. You go off the path when your feet aren't straight. You see, that's the danger. People people get wore out and the feet begin to turn. And you know, that reminds me of Pilgrim's Progress. Have you ever ever heard this part? I listen to the unabridged one. Um, Oftentimes when I go up to, typically when I go by myself, for whatever reason, my ladies and family don't like that version, but um, I like the unabridged. They don't like the old English, I guess. I listen to it when I go up to Austin. Listen to this. You remember, you remember when Christian got to the gate and he went in and there was a guy on the inside? His name was Goodwill. And, and here's part of the conversation they had. Look before thee. Dost thou see this narrow way? That is the way thou must go. It was cast up by the patriarchs, prophets, Christ, and His apostles, and it is as straight as a rule can make it. This is the way thou must go. Christian says, But, said Christian, are there no turnings or windings by which a stranger may lose his way? Goodwill says, Yes, there are many ways that abut upon this. And they are crooked and wide. But thus thou mayest distinguish the right from the wrong. The right only being straight and narrow. And you know what? Bunyan was very perceptive. Throughout that story, you find people jumping walls, people taking other ways, people meandering off. Even at times, Christian himself leaving and God graciously bringing him back on. It's a battle to keep the feet straight. And people perish. 
And if we really understood this, this these, are, these are verses that ought to cause us to tremble. Notice, notice the last half of verse 13. And I mean, you need to notice this carefully. Make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. You have a runner in a race of eternal life. He's spiritually lame. Something's wrong. There's a problem. The feet aren't right. Now look, at this point, the lameness is not fatal. But they're in danger. And one of two things can happen. One of two things. You see them there, right? Healing, that's one option. Or it comes out of joint altogether. And when that happens, you're done. This, this is fatality, spiritually speaking. He's not talking about a condition from which you come back. And you say, well, how do you know? Because of what follows. Because of the context here. Healing, or it comes out of joint. We should tremble. I know we don't. I mean, the, the, the Bible is dealing with the most dead serious issues in all of life. From the beginning of this book to the end, it's all about not drifting away from Christ. I mean, here you have, we know what it's like. You have somebody, they're, they're still in the church. It hasn't come out of joint yet. But it's, there's a lameness. Because, isn't that the dead giveaway? We recognize their feet aren't straight. What do you mean? Not straight. That path is looking to Jesus. That's the straight path. It's straight. It's narrow. And what we find is they're coming to church. They're singing the songs. They're there. But when you talk to them, you can find there's a distraction now. There's some worldliness creeping in. Their feet are beginning to, to turn off, to not be right and it may be they've been running the race for a while and they're weary, they're worn, they're cast down. They feel like, I need to take a break. Oh, isn't it, doesn't that happen? We justify. I've been running hard. I've been doing this. I've been doing that. Just, just a little break. But I tell you what, if your little break gets the feet crooked, you are halfway towards coming out of joint and it's fatal. And we need to we, we should tremble at these things. We see people like that. Their passion for Christ is ebbing. The first love is waning. The spiritual adrenaline is low. Christ, low Christ I mean, you, you get to that, right? You, you see the person, then they get to the place where Christ doesn't thrill their soul anymore. Why? Because when you talk to them, that's not what they want to talk about. They, spiritual things are not the first and most important thing. It's not in the forefront of their minds when you talk to them. It's something about the world. I mean, you know that. And this person used to not be that way. And what's that? That's, that's the feet. And they're coming off. They're, they're going wrong here. The hand's on the plow still, but, but they're, they're taking glances in other directions. It's very dangerous and if a specific change does not take place this thing rips out a joint altogether and then they are done and you know you know why we don't tremble because we don't think it's going to be us and yet here's Bunyan he writes his book and he shows one person after another and they're going off they're going back they're doing this they're I mean it's the few that make it to the end in that book why because he knew the reality he knew what scripture said he knows how many actually make it he knows Jesus' own words. And, and look, the seriousness of all this is found right here in the context. Just let your eyes go back to that text there. Look at verse 14. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness what without which no one will see the Lord. You see what's in his mind? His mind is you're not making it to see the Lord. Just keep going. 
See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. You want to know what it's on, on his mind when he's talking about this thing coming out of joint? It's you don't make it. You don't obtain the grace of God. This is what the whole theme of this book has been about. A, reaching that rest. Coming to finish the course. Being like these men and women of Hebrews 11. Sticking to it in faith. Looking, enduring, keeping on. You just keep reading. That no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble. He's talking about the kind of trouble that's not just this little fleeting thing. This is the final trouble. This is the ultimate trouble. By it, many become defiled. He's talking about a defilement of total corruption. Look, look, just follow. That no one is sexually immoral and unholy like Esau who sold his birthright. Men and women will sell their birthright. And, and what's happening? The feet aren't straight. The feet got off. When, you know what happens when this thing tears out a joint altogether? They sell their birthright. They trade. That's what you see. For a single meal. You know that afterward when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. That's what this is all about. This is all about playing footloose with Christianity and you just lose it. And you know the thing is, I mean look at Esau there. He's, he's hungry. That's all it was. He was hungry. He just had ordinary desires. You see, the, the reason some of us don't think we're going to apostatize is because we imagine it like just standing up in front of the church and saying, I reject Jesus Christ, and you go back into the world, or you run down and you don't join some cult or Satan worship, and you tear up Bibles. You, you see, nothing, nothing that drastic. This is just a man who, given over to one of the common desires of life, he sold his birthright. He was, do, do you recognize what that means? He had every possibility of having it be Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. But that's not the way we talk today. You know why? Because he sold his birthright. For what? For what? A single meal. You, you know what? Apostasy to me, based on this, feels easy. It's just easy. It's just getting discouraged in the Christian life and saying, I'm going to take a break. I'm just, going to, I'm, I'm just going to give in to some of my just common desires. Just take a break. And before you know it, there's no going back. He's rejected. I mean, that's, that's how all this fits together. That's, that, that's how... It, it's permanent loss here. People succumbing. I mean, this is what happens to people. It, it, just easy. And then, you know what? He wept and he cried. But there was no repentance. I mean, if you go back and you look at it, he wasn't broken before God. He wanted the blessing. That's why he wept and cried. But you know who he blamed? He didn't blame himself. Do you know who he blamed? Jacob. There was, there was no contriteness. There was no humility. You can see... You know, that's, that's what repentance is all about. Just having a heart that's broken for sin. And you, you, know, what pe you know what happens to people? They get to a place where they're, they're worn down, they're drooping. They feel justified to just appease some worldliness. That's it. Just don't pursue holiness without which you don't see the Lord. Just don't pursue it as much, just kind of coast, kind of take a break, relax. And you know what? It's like one day he looked up and he recognized 
I want that. And yet the repentance, his heart was hard. I mean, this is a wake-up call. He's not able to produce contriteness. He's not able to produce brokenness over having sinned against God. He's bitter against Jacob. And he recognizes that what he's lost is valuable and now it's too late. You get people who they ran well once. Again, this, this is such the picture of something in Pilgrim's Progress that some of you may remember. When Pilgrim came to the interpreter's house and the interpreter took him over to a man in an iron cage. I know some of you are familiar with this. He took him by the hand again and led him into a very dark room where sat a man in an iron cage. The man to look on seemed very sad. He sat with his eyes looking down to the ground, his hands folded together. He sighed as if it would break his heart. Then said, Christian, what means this? At which the interpreter bid him talk with the man. Christian said to the man, what are you? The man answered, I am what I was not once. What were you once? The man said, I was once a fair and flourishing professor. Both in mine own eyes and also in the eyes of others, I once was, as I thought, fair for the celestial city and had then even joy at the thoughts that I should get there. But what are you now? I am now a man of despair and am shut up and in this iron cage. I cannot get out. Oh, now I cannot. But how did you come into this condition? I left off to watch. That's just it. You leave off watching. You grow careless. You give in to worldliness. You give in to just the desire for a meal. I left off to watch and be sober. I laid the reins upon the neck of my lusts. I sinned against the light of the Word and the goodness of God. I've grieved the Spirit and now He's gone. I tempted the devil and He's come to me. I've provoked God to anger. He's left me. I've so hardened my heart that I cannot repent. Then said Christian to the interpreter, but is there no hope for such a man as this? The interpreter said, ask him. Christian, then said Christian, is there no hope? But you must be kept in the iron cage of despair. The man says, no, none at all. Christian said, why? The Son of the Blessed is very pitiful. The man said, I've crucified Him to Myself afresh. I've despised His person. I've despised His righteousness. I've counted His blood an unholy thing. I've done despite to the Spirit of grace. Therefore, I've shut Myself out of all the promises. And there now remains to me nothing but threatenings, dreadful threatenings, fearful threatenings of certain judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour me as an adversary. Christian says, for what did you bring yourself into this condition? And here it is. The man said this, for the lusts, pleasures, and profits of this world, in the enjoyment of which I did then promise myself much delight. But now every one of those things also bite me and gnaw me like a burning worm. Christian says, but can you not now repent and turn? Man says, God has denied me repentance. His word gives me no encouragement to believe. I mean, that's all God has to do. You have light and you just... You've put your hand to the plow. You look back. Your feet are out of line. You begin to indulge. Just whatever it is, you justify it. Oh, how easy it is to justify. Just a little bit of the world after all. I've worked so, after all, I've suffered so much. Just just a little indulgence. And then you know what? The day comes, he looks at the scripture. There's no encouragement in it. It's just a dead letter. And how can you make it alive when it's not? His word gives me no encouragement to believe. Yea, himself has shut me up in this iron cage. Nor can all the men in the world let me out. Oh, eternity, eternity. How shall I grapple with the misery that I must meet with in eternity? Then said the interpreter to Christian, let this man's misery be remembered by you and be an everlasting caution to you. Well, 
said Christian. This is fearful. God help me to watch and be sober and to pray that I may shun the cause of this man's misery. Sir, is it not time for me to go on my way now? And listen to an email that I got just this last week. My problem, this man says, is that I do not feel conviction. I do not feel bad when I sin. I do not feel love. I do not feel like I have a broken and contrite spirit. I do not feel desire inside. And yet I know that I want and wish to feel desire. See, he wants to feel and he can't. This isn't just any guy. He says, I think desire is God's Spirit pulling you to God and I don't feel God's Spirit pulling me to God. And you know what? He says that he's gotten to a point in his life where after being enlightened, he's come into this state. He came under the truth. He was there. And just like the man in the iron cage, he veered off. Just for a meal. He's, I mean, men and women sell their birthrights for a meal all the time. We've been given Hebrews to shake us. Men sell their souls for a bowl of stew. I mean, don't think hell isn't filled with people who sold their souls for some trifle just to appease some ordinary desire. Everyday desire. I mean, think, we just, it's a desire for ease. Just let me relax. Just let me sleep a little bit. Let, let me be unwatchful for a second. After all, I've, I've suffered a lot. I've run the race quite a while. I've served the Lord. I've done this. I've done that. Just, listen, you are in an enemy's land. And you're not done with this race till you get to an end. And if you start letting your feet go out, the next step is bang. It comes out of joint altogether. And from the context here, we're seeing... It's, it, it's like a holiness without which you don't see the Lord. You see falling short of the grace of God. You see men selling their souls for a, a meal. That's, that's what he's talking about here. This is, this is real life for us. We need to tremble. Men do make shipwreck. Men go to hell. And I believe, I, brethren, you, you just know it's easy to go to hell. It's a battle. It's a fight to get to heaven. What kind of people make it to heaven? It's the violent. It's the people that fight for it. It's the people that fight to keep their eyes on Christ. Fight to stay in love with Him. Fight, fight, fight. Fight for holiness. Not for the American dream. Not for a bowl of stew. But the thing we need to remember is what kind of people are these? these? These are the people at hand, the people in the context here, the people that are being discussed are drooping people. Remember verse 12? Drooping people. They're the ones that need to be warned this way. You know what? When, when you have a young convert and they're in here and they're all excited and full of spiritual adrenaline, they're not the ones that need this. It would seem that drooping Christians are most in danger. Of what? Of missing the holiness with which we see the Lord and failing to obtain the grace of God and allowing bitterness and trouble and defilement and selling their birthright. Why? Why is it that drooping people are most prone to this? Well, I mean, look. Our brother hit on it this morning. In, in the text he was dealing with, there was a therefore there. I mean, do, do you see verse 12? There is a therefore. Therefores are the kind of words you, can, you, you build your minds on. You build your thinking. You build your faith. 
This isn't a spiritual vacuum here. God doesn't say, oh, they're cast down. Just go over to them and tell them to be lift up. That's not it. There's therefores. There's, out, there's so many therefores and fours and these, these connecting words throughout Scripture which tell us what? God gives us truths that need to fill your head. Truths you need to think on. Truths your faith need to bite into. You need to latch. And it's only as we think right, as we've got these truths in our minds and we're pondering them, that we're able to come along and lift up those arms that hang down, set the knees right, the feet right, and run right. Why? Based on certain truth. And I, I picture this kind of like a mountaintop. Maybe you'll see this. I mean, the answer, the answer to all this, the answer about why drooping people are most prone has everything to do with the therefore here. I mean, do you all see it? You got your Bibles there? You can see the therefore? Scripture argues with us. By argue, I don't mean like two little kids that argue. I mean, it, it gets reasons. It seeks to convince it appeals to our right thinking. The, the Bible is full of doctrine. Why? Because we need that doctrine. That doctrine gives us stability. That doctrine keeps us on the path. We are given things to believe. Truth. Truth is what sets the feet right. That's what we have. But what I see before the therefore is the reason why we should lift our drooping hands. I kind of see this like a mountain. And on top of it, you've got the therefore. And coming up the one side, you're building, you're building, you're building. You have all the reasons as to why you should lift up your hands. It's building, it's building, it's building. You get to that top and lift up the hands. I see the Christian victorious on the top of that mountain standing on that therefore with his arms lifted up. That's what it's called. Can you see the man? Can you picture a mountain and a man at the top and his arms are lifted up? And coming up the side of that mountain, you've got all these reasons, these arguments that the, the author of Hebrews is giving us as to why we should lift up those hands. And then coming down the other side, we've got apostasy. We've got failing in the area of holiness and peace and, and a reaching this grace of God and, and Esau and going down. It's just this downward spiral of apostasy. But in the middle is that triumph. I don't know if that helps you all, but that's, that's kind of the picture that I saw in my mind as I was looking at this. And clearly, what causes the droop you can see it in verse 4, right? Weariness and faint-heartedness, which is caused by what? A struggle with sin. Huh, that's not a minor battle. You can see it in verse 5. Weariness caused by the discipline of the Lord. It's pain. I mean, we're in... A battle that is long, it is fierce, there's pain in the middle of it, there's difficulty, there's hills to climb. This, this, the Christian life is hard. It's pain. I mean, do you, got, do you all, you can see that in verse 11. Do you see the word painful? Brethren, if you, if you walk the Christian life and you hear that it's through much tribulation, don't, don't lose the word tribulation. It's pain. Suffering is pain. Trial is pain. It's exhausting. There are so many calls to endurance in Scripture because this is tough. This is a hard race. It's a hard course. It's a battle. It's uphill. It's against the flow of this world. You know it in Hebrews 10.32, if you remember back, recall the former days. What were these people enduring? After they were enlightened, after they'd come to this truth about Christ... 
They're endured a hard struggle with sufferings. I mean, that's the Christian life. A hard struggle. Sometimes being, this is their specific thing, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach, affliction, sometimes being partners with those so treated. They had compassion upon those in prison, joyfully accepted the plundering of their property. They joyfully accepted it at one day, but you know what happens? It begins to wear you out. And suddenly you wake up one day and the joy is not there. And suddenly the feet are, are going cocked here. There's this, you got your hand on the plow and it was joyful, but now you, you reach, you kind of reach a place in the race. You hit the wall. Your eyes start looking other places. This is what this, is what this book is about. It's rescuing us right at that point. And you know what? The droop is the first step to out of joint altogether and then it's over. So when the droop comes, you know that's dangerous ground because the next step, you end up like Esau. You can be healed at this point or you can come out of joint. It's serious. I mean, every time a Christian comes to that droop, it's a crossroads. An apostasy is on one side. And remember, it's just easy. It's just, you sell it all for a bowl of stew. It's really easy. Being healed, being encouraged, taking the truths upon which we need to build our lives. Now, I want us to just think about something for a moment. I once heard John MacArthur say that all pain, all suffering, all trials should be viewed as the discipline of the Lord. Several weeks ago, I heard our brother Scott say, you don't want to think of all suffering as being the discipline of the Lord. So Scott wants to take on John MacArthur. (laughs) But here's the thing. You know why Scott says that? Because, I mean, as as you read the text, and suddenly, when we're thinking discipline a lot of times, we're thinking, I sinned, and God responds by putting the rod to me somehow. And Scott can look at Scripture and say, hey, I see examples like Job who there wasn't any specific sin and God brought hardship into his life. Over against, there are definite examples in Scripture where we see that somebody sinned and they have to suffer in direct consequence of that sin. I mean, can you think of a notable example among Christians? David. You know, the sword was never going to depart from his house. And, and undoubtedly, a lot of times when we think about discipline, just, just as Scott did, you know why John MacArthur would say what he says? Simply because he's had, you know, like eight years of Greek. And he recognizes something. This word, you see it, it's in verse 5. It's in verse 6. It's in verse 7. It's in verse 8. It's in verse 9. It's in verse 10. It's in verse 11. Do you see the same word that shows up in all of them? What is it? It's discipline. The word discipline. And if you look at the meaning of that word, you know, we use the term discipline to mean something else than just spanking our children. How else do we use the term discipline? Now, if I said that is a well-disciplined military unit, you're not going to imagine, you know, some commander out on the battlefield paddling soldiers. That's not what you're going to think. What are you going to think? Trained. That's what you're going to think. And, And that word that's used all the way through here, 
it has that meaning. I mean, if you go to the lexicons, it's the instruction and training that leads to the forming of proper habits of behavior. Thayer's Greek lexicon says it's the whole training and education of children. And of course, a lot, when we read that, unquestionably, there's, there's a feel, there's a flavor that makes us think about, you know, looking over our shoulder at, did I, did I commit a sin? But the thing about this training, and, and that's, we see the word here. Do you see it in verse 11? Those who have been trained by it. This has to do with training. And you know what? All suffering is meant to purify our faith. All suffering, whether we've actually sinned and done something specific. Because you know in the end, Job, even though there wasn't a specific sin, do you see him at the end better than he was before? You see, it's all meant to take the slag out, to get the dross off, to make us holy. And I think that's why MacArthur would say what he, what he said. And, and I mean, I've, I've wrestled. But you know, as I've studied through Hebrews, the one thing that jumped out at me in the broader context here is among these folks being spoken to here, have you ever noticed that there's no specific sin that's called out? In fact, when you go back up to verses 3 and 4, it seems that when he jumps into talking about discipline and have you forgotten in verse 5, it's coming right out of speaking about hostility that is shown by sinners. Which, which un- inevitably these, these folks are enduring, right? When you go back to 1032, you see the kind of thing that they're enduring persecution. And it doesn't necessarily seem like there, there's nothing throughout the letter that indicates this persecution is in response to some specific sin on their part. And I know, look, if you can, if you can look over your shoulder when something difficult comes into your life and you see that there's there's some blatant sin in your life, well, God, in a, God wants you to deal with it. But I don't think we need to deal with all suffering. Yes, self-examination should be taking place as we go through life. And suffering will especially bring us to a place of self-examination. It, it did Job, right? I mean, all through there as he's dialoguing with his three friends there, he's, he's really examining his own life. And we, and we should look but this pain, this suffering, this, this trial, this is what brings the droop. I mean, that's, that's where we were going. That's what I wanted to... How do you get the drooping Christian? Well, it's because they've been suffering and they've forgotten. Right? Have you forgotten something? You get full of the droop when it's been hard. When God, I mean, you, you know what it says there in John 15, right? There, it doesn't talk droop, but it talks about God putting the pruning shears to you. He cuts you. He lops off pieces of you. When God is producing this holiness in us and righteousness, this peaceable fruit of righteousness, He, he hurts us. Now, it's temporary hurt. That is not meant to permanently hurt us. It's meant to permanently make us much better. It's meant to permanently produce holiness. But what happens a lot of times is we get, it's, it's like, I, I mean, you know what it feels like? It feels like the Lord doesn't like us, right? He's being hard on us. And you know what? If you forget that that's exactly how He produces the greatest amount of holiness in us, I mean, you come through a difficult time, a difficult time with your family, a difficult time with your spouse, a difficult time with some kind of, some kind of physical infirmity, just difficulties. You lose your job, financial difficulties. You, just, you get a lot in life. That some, God has handed you something that you look around and you just don't see other people have and you feel like, Lord, I can't bear up under this. This, this hurts. And, and you start to feel... Man, does God not like me? He doesn't favor me the way He does other people. 
what you may not realize is He's favoring you more. And, and what, what He's saying is, have you forgotten? Forgotten what? That He's dealing with you as a son. If you, if you recall back in Hebrews 5, 8, Jesus learned obedience through what? What He suffered. He learned. He was trained. He was disciplined. Not for, he had no sin. And, and what happens is, oftentimes the people that have to suffer the most, they end up being the most like Christ. They end up being the most holy. And, and what happens is, when you get to the point of droop, the way you get healed is to remember the therefore. Therefore. What? What? Hey, do, do you not see God's treating you as sons? Verse 6, the one He loves. Do you not see these words? You have verse 10, that we may share His holiness. Verse 11, the peaceful fruit of righteousness. For the moment, it's painful. But what He's doing is something eternally healthy for us. And if you get to the point where you droop, and your feet are, are moving, not directly down, not running this race without perfectly set. They're, you've got your hand to the plow and you've been going good and you've energized and strengthened and encouraged. And suddenly you're getting to the place where your, your, your energy feels like it's going. You feel discouraged. You feel like you've had to suffer too long. You feel like, the, Lord, this is, this is hurting. And this doesn't feel like God loves me. But you have to remember... This is exactly how God produces the greatest holiness and the greatest righteousness. And it, you see, right at that point, if you forget, you can easily end up like Esau. But if you remember, it's healed. If you, that's, that's what this is. This is lift up your, lift up your hands, your, your knees right, your feet straight. That's be encouraged. I mean, look at this thing and realize my life is only a vapor. No matter how difficult my, per my situation is, it's, it's only slight, it's only momentary. But your holiness is going to be proportionate to your suffering. And you know what? God could leave you alone a lot more, let you have ease, and you'd be far less fruitful. And I'll tell you this, when you step out of this world, when you go over to Revelation chapter 14, it says their works follow them. And I'll tell you, there is a reward in heaven. And if God has put you in the crucible and passed you through the fire more than others, it's to make you more useful. It's to make you more fruitful. And you know what? For eternity, you will profit from that. It will be to your credit. It will be to your account. It will be to your eternal glory. It will be for your eternal good. Believe it. I mean, the path to greatest holiness and the path to greatest usefulness and the path to greatest fruit, the path to greatest likeness to Christ, it's a hard one. I know it, and it's not one. It's one our flesh recoils from. We wouldn't pick it. But you can see, God does pick it. And it's the way He shows you you're His child. And it's not meant to harm you forever. It harms you now. It harms you physically. It harms you for the short. But it's for your eternal welfare. And you've got to remember this. That's the therefore. We've got to live on these truths, brethren. This is how you survive in the Christian life. You have to remember the truth of God's Word. If you forget, you end up in, in, in terrible places. I mean, you can see what's here. You pick up, be encouraged, think about how God's dealing with you. I mean, we need faith to survive this this path we're called we, we have to believe 
You have to believe these things, brethren. You have to believe that, that there is a God who treats his children this way and that this is an outpouring. This is a lavishing of his love. It's not something else. Don't misinterpret it. That's what this is all about. This is all about speaking to us in words and with truths and with doctrine, with teaching that's going to keep you going and make it to the end. When life hurts, when you're cast down, when you're just depressed, when you're discouraged, when you feel worn, when you feel like the trial has just been too long, too painful. If you think right, if you really think right, wow, this is, this is an indication that God loves me. This is an indication that God is for me. This is an indication God's making me more holy. This is a good thing. You can jump up. You get those feet straight. Okay, Lord, I'm watching. This, is, this encourages me. Doesn't, it still hurts. But this, is, this encourages me. I can keep pressing on. I know that you've got good. You're going to bring good out of this. I can't understand it and right now it just, oh, I wish I wasn't in this. But I know that this is a caring hand. This is a kind hand that's guiding me, that's ordering my path, that has written this script. I'm not just here all alone. My God knows about me. It's like I heard Charles Leiter say once, the gardener is never closer to the vines than when he's pruning. He's close. He knows. He knows. And, and you, aren't we told in this very same letter, we have a sympathetic high priest who's had to endure sufferings beyond ours so that when he looks at us, we can't say you don't understand because he became like us in every respect and he suffered more than we ever have. That's the whole argument. You haven't yet resisted to the shedding of your blood. He did. And when you come to Him and you say, Lord, it hurts. You see, there is a throne of grace that I can go to and I can expect to find help in time of need. He'll give me grace. He'll give me grace. But you can see in this letter, He wants you to ask. He wants you to come. He wants you to walk by faith, trusting Him, looking to Him, calling upon Him, thinking on these truths. Brethren, we're a young church and most of us have a long way to go in this race. You need these truths. And even if you're in a season of peace and rest and relative triallessness, it's only for a little season. Only a little season. Brother, we put our hand to the plow and you look, look down that road. Jesus is waiting at the end. Glory is waiting at the end. Eternal reward is waiting. Eternal life. This day you will be with me in paradise. Paradise awaits us. We shall behold God face to face. Don't sell your birthright for a bowl of stew. It's not worth it. This is, this is the race of life. If you've got things in your life that are slowing you down, that are hindering you, cast them away. It's not worth it. Brethren, Christ, Christ, that glorified bridegroom, He waits there. He beckons us on for the joy set before Him. And he, there's a joy set before us. I mean eternal pleasures. There is a joy. You, you don't want to miss this. You don't want to sell it cheaply. Don't be an Esau. I mean, think. Think. Are your feet straight? Are they straight? Is there something in your life taking you off course? Have you coasted? Are you drifting? And you know it. I mean, stop now. Healing is essential. Stop now.
Because very soon it could come out of joint. And then one day you look up and you say, I, I, I need that birthright. And suddenly you find, just like the guy that in the iron cage or the guy that I, I can't feel anymore. I go to God's Word now and it's just, it's dead. I mean, take heed. Take heed. This, this, is, this is a blessing from God because this is given to us to give us that encouragement. You're suffering it's on purpose. It's, it's not purposeless, right? I mean, sometimes our suffering, it feels like this is just so random. This is, this is purposeless, but it's not. It never is. And it's, it's, if you could see behind the scenes, God is just, he's working Christ-likeness into your life. And you don't, even, you don't feel it. You feel miserable is how you feel. And yet, you know, as people watch, they see you don't feel it. Just like a child is growing. They don't feel themselves growing, but you know, people that are watching, they say, wow, he's, you know, he's put on six inches over the last... That's, that's what happens. It's love. It's fatherly. It's holiness. It's righteousness. And you know what? That's what he's doing by it. And it says that we ought to strive after that holiness without which no one... He's working holiness. We need to strive for it. In other words, rather than fighting, rather than going after the stew. And isn't it that, that spirit of bitterness? It's real easy to become bitter, right? That's one of the things in here. Just, you, you saw it there. That, that root of bitterness. It can become, it, when you're suffering, it can become easy to become bitter. Or he talks about striving for peace with everyone. You know what? If you're like these Hebrew people and their persecution is coming from other people, it's hard to be at peace with other people when they're the very people that are bringing the pain into my life. Holiness. It's very easy to say, I, you know, I, I'm so wore out that striving after holiness and giving myself to that, I, I feel justified in coasting and taking a break for a while. I mean, you can see how all these things, and you just, and you get to the point where, you know, I deserve a vacation and I can just, I can just give in to just the, the regular appetites and the next step before you knew it, the birthright's gone and then when he wants the blessing, it's too late. God has given him over. Brethren, Christ, Christ is, is that treasure that is worth selling everything to have. And we can't see it. We don't behold that glory now and we don't feel it the way we should. I mean, we have seasons when our hearts feel delighted and they might feel overwhelmed and they might, there might be joy and, and we, we have these, these fleeting views of glory. But I want to tell you behind the scenes, He really is altogether glorious. And when we have Him, I mean, that's what's going to make paradise. Paradise is we have Him. We're, he is at the end. He is the great treasure. He is the great reward. He is, he is what we're striving for. God is giving us Himself. And yes, there's hell to be had if you fail, but if you fail, you lose the treasure. You lose the prize. Eternal life, more abundant, ought to be overwhelmed, overflowing with life because I have Christ. I, who knows what we're going to do for all eternity? Don't sell that cheaply. God, help us. Father, I pray You would make these world, words real, living, alive, powerful, preserving, life-giving. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.